Hello and welcome back to the Studio Canal Presents podcast. My name is Simon Brew from Film Stories magazine and this is our monthly podcast celebrating one of the biggest and deepest film libraries in the world. Studio Canal's extensive catalogue of films brings together cinema from around the globe going back over a hundred years. The full library is over 6,000 titles strong and includes everything from comedy classics, The Producers and Kind Hearts and Coronets, to haunting thrillers like the original The Vanishing, action-packed extravaganzas with Rambo First Blood Part 2 and Train to Busan, and flat-out cinema masterpieces such as Peeping Tom and Apocalypse Now. And we're going to be doing our very best to explore it all in this podcast. Every episode, I'm joined by a special guest for a deep dive into our film choice of that month. And along the way, we're going to be flagging up new releases, re-releases, films you might have seen, films you might not have seen, but hopefully adding a movie or two to your watch list as we go. In our next episode, we're going to be digging into the work of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Last time, we looked at probably the greatest British children's film of all time, The Railway Children. And this time, well... We're going for arguably the greatest British film of all time, full stop. The third man, hated by a thousand men. Desired by one woman. The third man, hanging is too good for him. Nothing is too good for the third man. Her man, who was the third man. The man on every woman's lips. That's a clip from the original trailer for Carol Reed's 1949 thriller, The Third Man, which you can stream right now in the UK on the Studio Canal Presents Apple TV and Prime Video channels. Now, I'm joined in the studio by Anna Bogatskaya, a writer and broadcaster. And it says here, Anna, that you learned English from watching a subtitled version of The Wizard of Oz. Is that right? Sort of right. It's the first time I remember actively watching a movie and falling in love with a movie. This is before I actually fully knew English. So I remember very vividly reading the subtitles and just being enamored with the magic of motion pictures. And I tried to share it with my classmates. I was seven or six at the time (laughs) and they did not get it because, you know, kids apparently are not into 1930s old Hollywood filmmaking, which frankly is just rude. And then it all got ruined because I went from beautiful, continental, heavily enunciated pronunciations of old Hollywood actors to, you know, like re-watching Trainspotting one too many times. That's when I knew that I had mastered English, when I could watch <laughs> Trainspotting without subtitles. Uh, was this primary or secondary school? Secondary. Okay, fair dues. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to tell you, wait, I was going to tell you about Harley Martins, an American, came all the way here to visit a friend of his. The name was Lime, Harry Lime. The Third Man, then. I know this is a film you absolutely adore. Can you set the scene for us? Can you tell us what is The Third Man and who the key people are in and around the movie? So The Third Man is kind of a a film noir and a whodunit. It's set in post-war Vienna and the American Holly Martins, who's played by Joseph Cotton, who would collaborate with Orson Welles quite a lot, arrives to Vienna supposedly to meet his old friend, Harry Lime, to do a deal. Passport, please. Oh. What's the purpose of your visit here? A friend of mine offered me a job here. Where are you staying? With him. 15 Stiftgasse. His name? Lime, Harry Lime. Okay. Thought he'd be here to meet me. But he's told that Harry is dead. Mr. Limes, an accident, knocked over by a car. I've seen it myself. Killed at once, immediately. But people start telling him different stories about how Harry died. So he smells something suspicious and decides to stick around and investigate. Even at the end, his thoughts were of you. What did he say? I can't remember the exact words, Holly. I may call you Holly, mayn't I? He always called you that to us. He was anxious I should look after you when you arrived to see that you got safely home, tickets, you know, and all that. But he said he died instantaneously. And in what I imagine in 1949 must have been an incredible plot twist, Harry Lyme is revealed to be alive. It's not a film that's shy either, because it sounds like a spoiler when you say that, but it's it's not a film that's shy about the ambiguity that in the end that he, he is actually alive. 
I think it's almost inevitable to talk about the big twist in The Third Man in the same way as it's almost inevitable to talk about the big twist in Psycho. Yeah. I do think it's really precious, genuinely think that it's really precious when people come to these films that we revere so much, that end up on so many greatest films of all time lists that are preserved and remastered and re-released and wonderful to experience and re-experience always. When you come to them without knowing what happens, without knowing the twist or the context, and you experience it fresh it's rare but it happens and i think that's beautiful so if somebody has genuinely did not know that harry was alive because they had avoided the big weighted cultural knowledge of it or had avoided the the trailers which all feature orson wells because obviously he's such an important figure in filmmaking i was just going to say to that conversely i i don't know how you can get to the third man and not know that orson wells is in it wouldn't it be fantastic if you were pitched that this had orson wells in it and you spend half the movie being like where is he is he hiding is he in makeup where is orson you're kind of really waiting for him to show up because he is the top build star in it and you really have to wait your time but I think it works beautifully I rewatched it for the purposes of this conversation and I'd forgotten about the first half because he is so memorable that I just remember the movie existing with him in it. But actually, there's so much time spent, maybe half the movie is spent on building up the figure of Harry before we actually meet him. And I'm sure we'll talk about this, the reveal of Harry being alive in the film. Even that reveal is so prolonged and so teased and features a grade A performance by a street cat too. (laughs) I knew we'd get to the cat. I remember reading an interview with Brian De Palma, I think it was in the 1990s, 2000s, and he was talking about casting. And if he was making a low-budget thriller, his argument always was, with a tip of the hat to Hitchcock, that he'd spend all the money on the star and kill them off early, that he wants to play with audience expectations Mm -hmm. of what a movie star was and is. So contextually, at the point an audience would have walked in to watch this in 1949, there would have been that heavy level of expectation that you were just talking about. There would have been, yeah, but also Orson Welles is always a um, troublesome figure in a way, because as much as he was famous and revered, he was also really disliked. And he's both an actor, a filmmaker, a storyteller, a theatre producer, a writer, a director, and an actor. And I think he's this sort of larger-than-life polymath that we really rarely get. I mean, I did not expect to make this comparison, but the most contemporary comparison I can make is like Childish Gambino, like Donald Glover, you know, a person who you recognize because he's an actor, he's in front of the camera and he's famous with that. And then it also has a whole musical side to him and is incredibly accomplished in that way and is also a, a writer and a comedian in his own right. So all of these different tentacles to his talent. And I think that presence, that largesse is so it fits so well with the figure and the character of Harry Lyme as well because you build him up so much that when he finally arrives with anyone else that's not Orson, it would be such a deflating reveal. Just on a point of order, I mm. don't ever remember Donald Glover voicing Transformers the movie. Not yet. No. Okay, well, there's time. You know, there's that right was, ahead of us. That was very late at Orson's career. Yes, but I like, also... you can't talk about Citizen Kane and The Third Man without mentioning Transformers the movie, surely. That's very true. But you know what Orson also never did? Did not make a movie with Rihanna. Fair dues, but, you know, digital technology these days. I mean, we're, we're building to that, really. Can you just touch on where Orson Welles was in his career at this point? So... He was a wonderkind of the theatre scene. He'd made his name on the stage. Um, He'd already had the very, very infamous moral panic of the War of the Worlds reading that he did on radio. And he'd already made a few films. So obviously his debut film is Citizen Kane. He got into a lot of trouble with that film because it it was a very thinly veiled satirical biopic of William Randall Hearst and um, his personality, his life and his affairs. And he'd also made a second film, which is actually my favorite Orson Welles film, The Magnificent Ambersons, which was butchered in the edit. And I believe that there's, it's never fully been released in the way that Orson intended it to be. Both those films featured collaborations with Joseph Cotton, who is the protagonist in The Third Man. And they were friends for the entirety of their lives and close collaborators. He'd also made uh, The Lady from Shanghai with his then girlfriend, Rita Hayworth. The thing that I always remember is that everybody got really upset that he made Rita dye her infamous red hair blonde for that film. It's a black and white film. Yeah, so red hair would not show up in the same way. So his situation in the industry is one of completely undeniable talent, but also completely uncompromising talent, which doesn't necessarily always 
go down well. Hello, old man. How are you? Hello, Harry. Well, well, they seem to be giving you quite some busy time. Now listen. Hmm? Yes? I want to talk to you. Talk to me? Of course. When we first talked about the third man, your mm-hmm. eyes absolutely lit up and you just said to me, Dutch angles. <laughs> I mean, Dutch angles, I mean, if you can just set them up what they are and just why they're so important to this film. Dutch angles are basically, it's a term in cinematography where basically just means the framing is kind of skewed and it's used for dramatic effect. It's obviously very unnatural to look at because you're essentially twisting reality. And it's a very simple trick, isn't it? But it has a really intense effect. It's very expressionistic. And this film, the cinematography in The Third Man is just extraordinary. You could screenshot every single frame of it and just hang it in the Louvre. One scene in particular that I really noticed that uses Dutch angles in a much more subtle way, I thought. Towards the end of the film, there's a conversation that Joseph Cotton and, and Orson Welles have in one of these, I always forget the name of them, the floating... Ferris wheel. Yep. And because of the sway of the cable car, obviously this isn't a set, they're not actually going above Vienna. The Dutch angles are used to mimic the sway on a Ferris wheel. And they're so subtle, you almost don't notice it until you do. But it's already putting you into that slightly unstable, tense situation where their relationship is also at. Exactly. Who did you tell about me? Hmm? I told the police. Unwise, Holly. The entire film uses Dutch angles for almost everything. The notable exception I found is when the reveal of Harry Lyme happens, where it's very stiff, hyper closed up framing. There's no Dutch angles there. There's no need for it because the shadows and his face do all the work. But everything else, because there's such an air of uncertainty and paranoia and sleaziness and everything is corrupt. This is obviously said post-World War II. So everyone is lying. Everyone is out for their own interest. Everyone has other dealings and goings-on happening that are not entirely sure. All the Dutch angles do is kind of skew the reality. Nothing is as it seems. And the more dramatic they are, Usually the more dramatic the sequences. So in the chases, in the manhunt, in the shootouts, the Dutch angles are basically, you're basically looking at a, at a man kind of running in, in the completely opposite way to reality. It's kind of reminiscent, you know, if you want to compare it to a more recent film like the hotel scene in Inception where yeah. everything starts twisting. But here it's, it's not subtle. It's just uh, draws a lot less attention to itself, I think. I mean, the Dutch angles, it's right that we give credit to Robert Kraska, the cinematographer of this one, who did win an Academy Award, also did the beautiful photography in David Lean's Brief Encounter as well. I never knew the old Vienna before the war with its Strauss music, its glamour and easy charm. Constantinople suited me better. Across your career of interviewing filmmakers, I would imagine you've come up against someone saying to you, oh, we we shot in this location and it was like a character in a film and that kind of almost cliche in filmmaking. But in the case of The Third Man, there's a real case for it, isn't there? That, Mm -hmm. That Vienna is absolutely pivotal to this movie. I wonder if you can just take us into that a little bit. It absolutely is. And and it's also kind of strange because I don't know how you feel about this, but sometimes when I'm watching films uh, that are set in cities and the city plays such a huge part of them yeah. and I haven't been to the city, so I don't know it. I haven't walked those streets. I don't recognize the spaces. It's a very different experience than watching something that's set in a city that I know fairly well or, or have just been around. And you get a real sense of a very particular shade of Vienna. I've never been, but the two movies that I think about when I think of that city is Before Sunrise and The Third Man. No more two polar opposite examples of the same city. Light, romantic and beautiful and kind of uh, with a very light sky, even at nightfall. And then a city that is completely consumed by shadows, where every single doorway, every single window, every single alleyway is so menacing. And that is completely down to the cinematography and the framing, the Dutch angles that we were talking about. But that is the atmosphere that Vienna has in The Third Man. It is a city of shadows and lies. Harry Lime literally lives in the sewers of the city. So we're going down underneath the beautiful cobblestone streets of Vienna. There is no room for 
picturesque scenes. There was no room for, you know, showing us a lovely park or a beautiful building. No, it's all dirty. It's all dark. And most of the time, the peak action scenes are shot actually in the sewers, literally in the trash. Is that you? You're through, Harry. Come out. You haven't got a chance this way. What do you want? You might as well give up. We've touched on this amazing character of Harry Lyme. I wonder if you can talk to the reveal of him and the power of that reveal. I mean, this is the main reason why I wanted to do the third battle. <laughs> that reveal, I had to rewatch it, that scene about three times because I kept getting goosebumps at the reveal, even though I knew it was going to happen. The buildup of it, there's a little cat that runs down the street is attracted by something, by some really nice broke shoes. And is playing with these shoes and looks up. And it's just a man in their darkness. Could be a killer, could be a detective. Joseph Cotton doesn't know. Everyone is chasing everyone. Step out in the light and let's have a look at you. Who's your boss? And suddenly an old lady pulls out a window because there's noise and she starts yelling in German. <laughs> and the light from her window illuminates only the face, only the face of Orson Welles, who is playing Harry Lyme, who is supposed to be dead. And in that reveal, he looks both surprised, absolutely not surprised, and has just flashes this cheeky little smile. It is a hell of a look, isn't it? It is an amazing look. I mean, I know this is, you know, decades before this expression would be coined, but there's no one in classic Hollywood cinema that had more BDE than Orson Welles in that one scene. He had more what, sorry? Big dick energy. Big dick energy. In that scene. Is that really what we were building up to? Yes. Okay. There is no one else who could have played wordlessly that reveal because it doesn't, he doesn't say anything. He just smiles and he kind of winks at Joseph Cotton as though he should have known all along that he was alive and he was actually maneuvering the situation from the shadows, from the sewers. By the way, I should just say, he's wearing way too nice a shoes and a coat to be spending time in the sewers of Vienna. And we can't talk The Third Man as well without addressing the fact that it's music. I mean, it, the music is astonishing, but also the music is chart-topping levels of astonishing as well. Can you take us into just like the iconic audio of this movie? I'm not going to try to replicate it. Do it, sing. I absolutely cannot. Is that right? one of the most iconic themes of any film ever made. I think even the thing that makes it terribly recognizable is that it's very simple. You could hum it. It also, it's the zither. I think that's how you pronounce yeah. it. Which is an instrument I think not that many people had heard of or heard sounding a playing before The Third Man, uh, before Anton Karras used it for the composition, especially Harry Lyme's theme. You know, the, it's called different things. I think it's called The Third Man theme, Harry Lyme's song, Harry Lyme's theme. That becomes a sort of motif that happens almost every time that his name is mentioned or that he comes up, definitely when he shows up. So you instantly associate it, not just with the film, but with this character in particular, with, you know, his... Um, the power that he still has supposedly after death. And I think even people who haven't seen The Third Man will recognize the music. So when they see it for the first time, they'll be like, oh, that's where it's from. That's what did it. Isn't that the best possible mark of a, a truly influential theme music? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm still blown away by the fact that it would go on to top the music charts. Just a piece of instrumental film music at an era where, I, let's just say, I don't think that was particularly commonplace mm. for it to do so. It's a bop. It's a bop. It's a bop. I think sometimes when we talk about older films, particularly ones like this one that we revere, it almost puts a wall up around them 
they're almost dismissed as too academic or too posh or not accessible. Mm-hmm. And I, I always think of something like Hitchcock's North by Northwest, which by modern standards is a great big, huge Hollywood blockbuster. It just happens to have been made decades earlier. The Third Man, just as a thriller, I mean, just to take one part of it, it's just a big mainstream thriller in the midst of it all, isn't it? It is. It's a great structure, um, a great narrative structure. It's very accessible. It's a mystery. It's got a great anti-hero before we even really had anti-heroes. I mean, everybody loves Don Draper and Walter White and Tony Soprano now, especially in the aftermath of the golden age of television. But like, if you think about Harry Lyme and, you know, to go back to another really, really memorable scene with him when he gives his big Swiss cuckoo's clock speech, he is fundamentally a sociopath. He does not care about human life at all. He only cares about himself. We never quite understand whether he cares about his friend or not because he talks a big game. But actually, in that one scene, he thinks it's worthwhile to have war and famine and troubles if it creates art and things that he thinks are above actual human life, things that he values more than human life. He calls people little dots. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spend? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax. He could not care about anyone. And yet, because he's played by Orson Welles with that cheeky charm, it becomes really strange to root for him to escape when actually he's telling us outright that he would kill any of us in an instant if it meant getting his way. Nobody thinks in terms of human beings. Governments don't. Why should we? They talk about the people and the proletariat. I talk about the suckers and the mugs. It's the same thing. Antiheroes are fascinating because they're a very pure collaboration between the charm of an actor and a performer and actually a good script, something that's complicated and meaty that makes us feel complicated things. All the TV shows that I've mentioned, you know, stuff like The Sopranos, stuff like Breaking Bad, stuff like um, Mad Men, we're at the center of it. We're going really deep inside characters who are on the spectrum of evil to unlikable. <laughs> And you're still rooting for them to get away with whatever it is, whatever heinous stuff they're up to. You're still rooting for them to cheat on their wives. You're still rooting for them to sell more drugs. And for hours, not for a hundred minutes like we are with The Third Man or for 10 minutes that we spend with Harry Lyme. And I think The Third Man was one of the very early examples of an anti-hero who we wanted to spend time with. No, I love Orson Welles as an artist, as a storyteller, and as a screen presence. Harry Lyme is a great character, but also we should not be rooting for Harry Lyme. And yet every time he tries to run for it in those sewers, I'm rooting for him to run away. And that I love. The fact that he's also basically on screen for all of 10 minutes, and yet makes such a big impact, is kind of extraordinary. And I don't know if I'm right about this, but I do get the feeling that the third man as revered as it is, as universally acclaimed as it is, you know, it's always ends up on the greatest films of all time yeah. list, greatest British films of all time. I think it topped the BFI one yeah. um, years ago. It's never talked about as much as other Orson Welles films. It's definitely talked about as, you know, the most well-known Carol Reed film, but a lot of people have seen or, have, or say that they have seen Citizen Kane. But I don't think The Third Man has the same... And it feels almost disgusting to say this brand recognition as other films. And it should, because it is very accessible. It's very entertaining. It's very fun to watch. And it really fits, I think, in the aftermath of our the golden age of the antihero. I think it's so much more accessible now because we're much more used to seeing complicated and likable antiheroes on screen. In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. So long, Holly. Before you leave us, Anna, uh, it's traditional on this podcast already, even though we're only three episodes in, to ask our guests to come up with a double bill from the deep archives of Studio Canal. And you've picked two films for us. Can you tell us what you've chosen and a little bit about them? 
So I picked the 2011 spy thriller, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, that has, I mean, everyone and their mother from British cinema is in this. You've got Gary Oldman, you've got Colin Firth, you've got Tom Hardy, Mark Strong, you've got Benedict Cumberbatch, Stephen Graham. Basically, anyone who is not in this is not a working actor in the UK film industry. It's so fantastic. And I picked it because it has that shadowy, corrupt vibe that The Third Man also has. I know. But it is one of five men. All I want from you is one code name. It's based on a John le Carré novel, and it is, you know, deception upon deception upon deception. Everyone is a double agent. Everyone is lying to one another. So the fun of watching it is trying to see who's lying or who's lying to who at what point, just trying to keep the story straight. It's very fun, especially for anyone who's a fan of the whodunit energy or spy thrillers in particular. We're not so very different, you and I. We both spend our lives looking for the weaknesses in one another's systems. Don't you think it's time to recognize there is as little worth on your side as there is on mine? And then I also went with a much older film, perhaps at this point lesser known. It's certainly very well known in France. So the 1936 genre noir film, Le Crime de Monsieur Lange, it's kind of a comedy as opposed to a thriller, but I picked it because it also has a charming anti-hero in a way. Essentially, it's about a character, the titular Mr. Lange, who kills his landlord and is helped by the other residents in his building. And if, if memory serves, I watched this film as a student when I went through my big genre noir phase. And it's one of these films that everybody has seen in France and is just gorgeous direction should be seen a lot more especially since it's so readily accessible and a very fun way to empathize with a character that we maybe we shouldn't be empathizing with and just to tie those to the third man do both of those films also have stray cats in them oh my god you've caught me i actually don't know (laughs) listeners please report back do both these films also have grade a performances by stray cats in them anna bogatskaya thank you very much for your time thank you so much for asking me on to talk about orson welles and stray cats So if you haven't seen it, or if hearing all of that made you want to watch it again, then you can stream The Third Man on the Studio Canal Presents channel on Apple TV and Prime Video right now, where you'll also discover a load more world-class entertainment. In fact, if you'd like to join Anna for her fantasy double bill, you can find Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and The Crime of Monsieur Lange on there as well. Let's turn our attention to what else is going on in the world of Studio Canal now. And we're going to put on your radar a bunch of films that are currently in the works and heading to cinemas over the next year or so. After Asif Kapadia's extraordinary documentary Amy, the life of Amy Winehouse is being brought to the screen in a new feature film. It's going to be called Back to Black and it's been made with the backing of the late singer's estate. Fifty Shades of Grey director Sam Taylor-Johnson is behind the camera and she's reuniting with the writer behind her first film, Nowhere Boy, Matt Greenhouse. What we don't know at the time of recording is just who'll be playing Winehouse in the film and it's fair to say there's no easy shoes really to fill there. Ken Loach, meanwhile, is putting the finishing touches to his latest film, The Old Oak. This one started filming back in May 2022 in the northeast of England and he's back together again with writer Paul Laverty. Now the pair have made many films together stretching back to 1996's Carla Song and including 2016's I Daniel Blake. The story this time is centred on the last remaining pub in a small English village as the mines are closed around it. The Old Oak is in post-production now. And then, of course, there's the news that the beloved Paddington is returning to cinemas. Dougal Wilson has now been named as the director of the third film, which is going by the name of Paddington in Peru. Now, it's been a long time coming, but the new movie will shoot in London and, yep, in Peru in 2023 and will bring our favourite bear back to the screen. Now, if I had my way, a Hugh Grant spin-off movie from Paddington 2 would be in production by now as well, but... 
I only do the podcast, and if I develop more powers, you'll be the first to know. Eeny, meeny, miny. Bear. There are plenty more projects as well about to go into production from Studio Canal that I'm dying to tell you about, and we're going to have more on those in future episodes of the podcast. And that's it for this episode of Studio Canal Presents. Next time, we'll be joined by Empire editor Nick DeSemlian as he helps me dig into the work of Arnold Schwarzenegger. To find out more about Studio Canal Films and the Apple TV and Prime Video channel, you can visit www.studiocanal.co.uk or follow Studio Canal at Studio Canal UK on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. I'll see you back here next time for the next episode of Studio Canal Presents. Ta-ta for now. <laughs>